Our next speaker, Vladimir, will talk about something that you haven't heard in these two days. We had talks about AI, but now we're going to take a different spin in IT. So we're going to hear something about Web3 and its future of innovation. So give a warm welcome to Vladimir. Thank you. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is Vladimir. I'm director of R&D uh, at MVP Workshop company from Belgrade that is working in Web3. I'm also uh, a lecturer and head of web department at SA Institute Belgrade. Uh, today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my personal opinions about the future of Web3 and why you should care about it. Uh, another thing, I mean, I'm a father of two sons and they like to hear stories a lot. So maybe I will tell you a few stories because I get used to telling stories. Uh, and my story begins like this. This is my personal story. Uh, I don't know how many of you know what is this, but this is one of, one of the first uh, modems. Well, uh, uh, actually, this is the, how I got infected with web. Uh, in, it was, I think, 1994 uh, when I discovered internet uh, using this device. And from that moment on, I basically started uh, investigating, playing around, experimenting. Uh, and sometimes, like two, three years after that, I was actually uh, working professionally in the web industry. And for, yeah, well, past two decades uh, and more, two and a half decades, I'm in web technologies. Uh, but I never really considered, uh, you know, when blockchain started, you know, when people started mentioning blockchain at the time, I was not really uh, co consider, you know, switching to, to something like that. Uh, it was completely, you know, you know that there is some kind of technology there, but you don't really care about it. And just for the people who are maybe not that much into this terminology, uh, what are, well, Web 1, Web 2, Web 3? Generally, um, Web 1 was something that we had in the 90s, uh, and it was just, you know, static, read-only uh, internet where information was coming from the server to you. It was rarely interactive in any way. And then Web2 became participa uh, participatory, where we included the users and started, uh, you know, uh, actually uh, generating user-generated content, and this is the web as we know it today. Now, the Web3, actually, uh, Sir Turner, Tim Berners-Lee, actually, when he was talking about Web3, he had a little bit different vision. He was talking about semantic web. Uh, but somehow, this term, Web3, uh, stuck. Uh, and it was something that we are using nowadays to, to talk about decentralized uh, internet, decentralized web without intermediaries. Basically, it is about blockchains. Now, when you hear about blockchains, and this is the reason why I was actually uh, hesitant to, 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 to go into this space in the first time, uh, when you hear about blockchains, the first thing that you probably hear are like crypto scams, uh, things that are, you know, breaking the headlines of the news very often. And it was so many of them. These are just some stats, some of the scams that were, you know, kind of uh, popular in the, in the media, you know. Uh, but it is happening almost daily, you know, and people, especially programmers, <coughs> who, who like to work with proven, tested technologies, you know, have some kind of fear, or I would say maybe not really fear, but, uh, well, distance. From, from this kind of technologies because it's connected to, to uh, well, scams. Uh, another bad thing about crypto is basically volatility of the tokens itself. You know, like uh, if you ever invested in any cryptocurrency, you realize that it is really changing the value very, very fast, very rapidly. Uh, and on the other side, in order to play with these technologies, you have to use crypto. You know, so basically, you know, even if 
regardless if you're investing or you know just playing around, you still need to use crypto, and then suddenly you realize that you paid something that actually lost 90% of the value overnight. And this is another reason why people are kind of distant from, from these technologies. There are many more challenges. First of all, you know, this is something I realized in 2016, 17, I think. This was the year when one of my former colleagues asked me to join his team as a tech lead. And the idea, I mean, it was a crypto project. Now, just to give you a, my story at the time, you know, I was so much in Laravel at that time. I was developing uh, PHP mostly, PHP JavaScript, and I was really much into it. I, I think uh, I had a knowledge at that time to, to be a member of a core team to work with, with uh, Taylor Rothfeld together, you know. So I was really much into technology, and then you have a guy calling you to join a project to work on some blockchain that you really don't know anything about. You don't know anything about technology. It was a really brave decision. Uh, it was only the, 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 I don't know, this friendship with this guy and, you know, kind of trust that I had in him that made me actually to go that route. But this is the moment when, you know, like 20 years I'm working in all these, uh, let's say, Web2 technologies. I feel very confident about my knowledge. I feel very, very into it. You know, I worked on uh, large scale projects. I work on all kinds of things like 13 uh, programming languages, tools, technologies, everything. And then suddenly I come to a world where I don't know nothing about. Uh, the first of the surprises was actually that everything has a price. You know, if you want to write something on a blockchain, you have to pay a transaction fee and transaction cost. One of the major surprises for me was when we, we wanted to write down some data on the blockchain and realize that we spent uh, $10,000 uh, for just one, one transaction. You know, it was not really one transaction. We had to write, write some, some, some uh, uh, list of, of whatever. But the point is that it was like a throwing, uh, you know, used car out of the window, you know, just in one click. And it was like, come on, this is so strange. Then Web3 has definitely ridiculous slang. I don't know. Uh, it reminds me uh, of sometimes... There is a nice sketch by Eddie Murphy. I don't know if you looked at it uh, on Comedy Central from 90s, when he's talking about how James Brown became popular without actually knowing how to speak. You know, because when you listen to James Brown, you don't understand what he speaks about. And I don't know if you ever happened to you, but it happened definitely to me that I was talking with some Web3 developers, you know, and you know, like I feel confident, as I said before, I used, I did so many things in Web2. I, I think about myself that I really understand the technology. And then there is a guy telling you something like, you know, come on, do it one more time. Yeah. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? I, I don't understand half of the things that he said, maybe 90% of the things that he said. So there is a lot of slang. There is a lot of, you know, this culture that is kind of strange then it's a very steep learning curve. People who are trying to enter the field basically need to learn a lot, and even experienced developers can get discouraged very fast. <clears throat> then slow general adoption, you know, like uh, can you explain cryptocurrencies to a grandma? Uh, well, it is a little bit challenging, right? Then tech is developing at the neck breaking space, you know, like it's so fast. Even if you learn something, it can be completely obsolete six months after that. Or, you know, like you, you can get surprised how things change rapidly. And there are a zillion of projects, ecosystems, technologies, tools, you know. So if you go into the ecosystem, you see that you, there are no standards, there are no tested and proven methods how to do things. It's very, well, I would say something that we as a developers do not like. Right? We like systems, we like rules, we like that everything works as you expect. So the question is, why would you bother? Why would you care? Why would you even consider working in Web3 field at all? And well, this is my realization. If you truly understand Web3, 
and don't fall in love in it, you're probably a notorious misanthrope. You don't care about the world. You don't care about people. Because once you do understand the philosophy and what kind of problems Web3 can solve, well, it somehow you get to this realization, I have to do this because this is the only way to solve some of the issues that we have. This is the only way to go forward. I'm not saying that Web 2, as we know it today, will disappear and be replaced completely by Web 3. No, they will probably coexist because some, some level of centralization is actually okay. And even people from Web 3 world are, you know, coming to realize that. But there are some problems that cannot be really solved in a way, and you are programming some of the, well, uh, things that have serious privacy issues. You are creating some things that actually somebody is using to misuse the user, to take their information, sell it, and so on and so on. And you are aware of it, right? You don't have to work for Google for that. I mean, so many other companies, smaller companies, are basically not really caring too much about personal data. Uh, and it's not only about privacy. It's about different use cases that you simply cannot do with regular centralized technologies. Now, <clears throat> you probably read this book, Blue Ocean Strategy, and this is probably another reason why you would consider working in Web3. Because, well, this is Web2. You know, it's a red ocean. There are so many sharks, so many projects, so many things already done. I'm not saying that there is no place for innovation. Obviously, it is plenty. But, you know, if you go to Web3 technologies, it's actually really interesting because you have so much more potential to innovate, so much more potential to create amazing things that actually nobody else ever thought about. And this is like, well, chart of what types of innovation exist, you know. And if you take a look at it, I would say that this right side is actually sexy ones right? The ones that we would like to be part of. So disruptive innovation, obviously the best, the one that moves the market the most and that is, well, completely new technology. This is probably somebody, well, who would like to innovate. This is, this is a dream, you know, if you have this kind of innovation. But also radical innovation that maybe doesn't move the market that much, but, it all, uh, but nevertheless, it's a new technology. It's completely a breakthrough, you know? And on the left side, we have something that we, you know, like as established companies have to do, do innovation in small increments, or maybe do something that is a bigger increment and, you know, like changes the market picture more, but it doesn't really make any kind of huge disruptive innovation in the technology field. Uh, as I told you, I'm running a team called 3327, and we are basically a team of researchers assembled to experiment and play with cutting edge technologies, mostly in the field of Web3, not exclusively. And we are a community uh, that we try to figure out what are going to be the technologies of the future, how the future is going to look like in five years, in, in 10 years maybe, you know. And we are, well, I will tell you more about how do we do it, and I will also tell you some of our learnings, because they may help you, whether you are in, well, Web 2 or Web 3, it doesn't really matter, but it can, it can help you in a way how you think about innovation, and if you want to innovate, what would be, well, I'm not saying this is the best way, I, I am just sharing our experiences, and you will see what you can do. But first, another story. I don't know if you know this picture, but this is a small village. Uh, well, I will not tell the name, but uh, there was a boy in the 19th century who was born in this village, and the village is in the middle of nowhere. And basically, if he didn't do, I mean, if he didn't have one specific advantage of other uh, kids in the neighborhood, he would probably, you know, stay there, become a shepherd, you know, uh, a farmer, basically, uh, because this was normal career of that time, right? But he had one advantage, and the advantage was that his father was actually really much educated. He was an Orthodox priest, 
And he was basically, uh, he had a huge library of books, not just science, but also poetry and everything. And he learned to learn very early. And he actually got, uh, well, inspired to learn more. And I, pro I, I guess that most of you know who I'm talking about. It's Nikola Tesla, right? How it ended, you know, and probably none of us will be here today if there was no Tesla to bring us electricity at least, you know. So we'll probably do some other types of jobs today. Nevertheless, uh, why I'm telling you this? Well, because Tesla was a great inspiration for our team. I'm not saying that we are trying to be Tesla. Tesla was one of a kind. We don't want to compare ourselves with him. But we wanted to learn from him how to make innovation in something that is completely chaotic, basically. That is completely, uh, you know, fast changing and where you cannot really understand what is going to be in six months, not, not to talk about five years. Okay? And, well, we realize that we have to be bold. We realize that we need to have a bigger vision of tomorrow, that we have to think big, not to be afraid to experiment, to play around like kids. And this is hard in regular business, right? Because you need to make profit for your company. And it's not like, well, we would like to experiment, but you know, you have to somehow earn the money, right? Uh, we realize that we have to give up on this philosophy of earning money through innovation and just innovate for the sake of innovation. And money will come eventually. But we realized, let's just play. Let's just see what kind of things we can, we can you know, let's, by the way, I don't know if you know, but 3327, the name of our team is actually called by the number of the room in which Tesla lived in New York uh, in the last decade of his life. And, well, we are greatly inspired in how, because he was such a guy. If you read about him, you, you will see that he was not caring too much about profit. Actually, not at all. He was thinking about how to make the world a better place. Another inspiration, and I would say that's a very important one we found in actually martial arts. We figured out that we need some sort of idea how the researcher, how a person who works with us should behave. Uh, what kind of values? And by the way, these are the values from karate. These are dojo values. We just tr translated them to something that we do. And this is like, seek perfection of the character, be faithful, believe in the power of innovation, endeavor to excel, strive for perfection in your work, respect others, which is very important, and finally, do good. Our aim is to support the community and change the world for the better. We also have this NFT collection uh, coming out next year that will actually illustrate these rules that we are talking about, but this is maybe not important today. Now, then what we did, what is the result of this philosophy and way of thinking? First of all, we decided to make some order because it's so many technologies, so many things, it's very hard to actually figure out which of them should we use or not, how, and so on. It happened to us a lot of time that we missed the innovation that happened in other ecosystems because we were just focused on one. It happened to us that we missed the waves of some tech revolutions, even where in times where we were doing on this technology, but then it was maybe too early, and then we gave up and do something else. In the meantime, it became the big thing. So we decided to put some order into it. And this is one of the things that we do. It's called Web3 Technology Radar, which is basically, basically a tool heavily inspired by ThoughtWorks Radar, which some of you maybe know, uh, where we actually try to map all the technologies in Web3 different ecosystems and uh, actually put them on this radar in four different categories. Adopt, trial, assess, and hold. So adopt are technologies that we believe that currently should be used for the majority of projects. 
assess are the ones that we want to try, but this, it's still early. And trial are the ones that we are playing around, but maybe are not mature enough. Why do we do this? This is not something that we do for money. This is completely open source uh, effort, I would say. We are inviting community to bring uh, their own opinions about, to challenge our thinking, or to propose new technologies. Because the idea is that somebody who is actually who wants to go into the space can come here and say, OK, these are the things that I should probably start learning first. Another thing is knowledge sharing. I mean, a lot of the times, especially in the world of corporations, IP is very important. Everybody is hiding their projects and they're, they're ready for the market. We have completely different philosophy. Knowledge sharing. We have a website where we publish our research. It's public for everyone to read. And if you are interested, you can go and visit the website, put a comment if you like. We give everything we do to the community without expecting anything in return. So finally, what are the recommendations that I can give if somebody is trying to innovate in a world like this, where nothing is for certain? Well, I would say the following. First, do it for the sake of technology and science, not for the sake of profit. I'm not saying that profit is not important. Obviously, it is. You have to pay the researchers in the end, the programmers, right? But you will also find out that there are so many organizations in the world willing to fund open source research. That they are willing to actually support your efforts and that you don't really need to grab the profit at any cost. Profit will come eventually, even, you know, this way or another. Do it for the sake of humanity. This is another thing that I realized working in Web3 is a huge problem, you know. There are so many cool things that people create, but these are just cool things, you know, that people like to play with without really idea what is the problem that this technology is solving. And Web3 is basically, well, kind of revolutionary technology, something that should enable, let's say, less developed countries to, 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 to live better, something that should, you know, change the world for the better. And we are not supposed to maybe create, you know, another NFT game that will just make some few selected people rich because they bought it first or something. I'm not really against such projects because they bring a little bit of fun to everything. But I'm completely not talking about it, right? What we think is an innovation, is an innovation that actually solves actual problems that people have. And there are so many amazing projects in Web3 uh, with this goal. Then, as I said, I think it's very important that you create this innovation culture and methodology. I was not talking too much about methodology that we use today, but I talked about culture. The culture is our values, our inspirations that we take from Tesla, inspiration that we take from martial arts. Maybe it's just a wrap-up story uh, around it, but it gives us some direction. And it gives us ability to actually celebrate our failures, which is one of the topics here, rather than be sorry about them. You know what we do? We do these killer experiments. The idea is to actually uh, devalidate idea as soon as possible. You know, if somebody has an idea, we try to do everything to kill it. Not in a bad word, not in a bad sense, not like discouraging the people to, to bring their ideas, because this is another thing that is very important so that nobody uh, is, uh, you know, ashamed to give an idea, whatever the idea is. But we are trying to actually, you know, uh, prove ourselves that it doesn't work like that, because eventually we will figure out what works. You have to think bold. If you don't have this vision of changing the world in a way, if you don't have this vision of, well, then you're going to do this incremental innovation, which I'm not saying is wrong, but it's not my cup of tea at least. And then finally, share the knowledge. 
uh, as a professor on university, as a, somebody who is in business for more than two decades. So many times I had people from, you know, with different ideas in, in software ideas and coming to me and say, well, would you sign an NDA? Uh, I, will, I will tell you your, my idea, but please don't tell it to anybody else. Things like that, you know that, right? This sucks. Nobody cares about ideas until they're made. And at any moment that you have one idea, there are at least five other people in the world with the same idea. It's only a matter who is going to make it. And this is why there is no reason to hide it at all. What you can do actually is completely the opposite. You should share it with people because people can give you feedback, because people can help you develop these ideas to become better and eventually come to the solution of an actual problem. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm open to discussion.